Professor Rajiv Bhargav teaches at the Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He took his PhD degree from Oxford University and wrote a widely acclaimed philosophical tract called Individualism in Social Science, Forms and Limits of Methodology, which was published under Oxford University's Philosophical Monograph Series in 1992. Subsequently, he wrote many significant articles which were published in important academic journals. He was selected a senior fellow in ethics at Harvard University in 1995-96, which is a remarkable achievement on the part of an Indian philosopher. The present book, Secularism and its Critics, has been edited by Rajiv Bhargav with an impressive introduction and an excellent closing chapter of his own. Oxford University Press has published the book this year in the series Themes in Politics. We have invited Rajiv Bhargav and Savita Singh to discuss the book Secularism and its Critics. We all agree uh, more or less that as modern Indian citizens of Indian state, we are secular people. And f for some time, we did not think that it could become controversial. We thought that it was more or less settled. But now it seems that we are in some sort of crisis of definition, definition in the sense of our self-understanding as secular Indian modern citizens. Professor Bhargav's book, Secularism and its Critics, addresses this particular crisis and that is why it is so important. Is the secularism that we understand is the only definition that we have or do we have different understandings of secularism? Well I think there is a broad agreement that uh, secularism uh, means the separation of religious and political institutions. Uh, but beyond this agreement there is a lot of divergence in interpretations. There are a number of uh, versions, a number of formulations of what secularism uh, is. Uh, and I should like to spell out very briefly four different interpretations of secularism. Uh, on the first interpretation, secularism uh, means, or rather the separation of religion from politics means exclusion of religion from state institutions. And uh, once uh, religion is ex excluded from state institutions, the state within this version is, uh, uh, has the sanction to intervene in religious affairs in order to promote just about any value. Now, this secularism is seen by a lot of people as hostile to religion. And I think there is uh, quite a bit of truth in this. Uh, this kind of secularism is uh, somewhat hostile, I must say. Separation, the separation component of the definition of secularism. Separation still means exclusion, but uh, exclusion doesn't entail any hostility to religion. I mean, the idea here is that both religion and the state are to insulate themselves. So uh, both uh, adopt a policy of mutual abstinence. Uh, religion is to keep to its own domain, and the state must keep to its own domain without one interfering with the other. That is the second interpretation. Uh, then there is a third interpretation, according to which uh, separation really means neutrality. And neutrality is very different from exclusion, because uh, when uh, the state is neutral, then it must help or hinder different religious groups to an equal degree. So this is a policy of equidistance. It is, d does not entail excluding religion. It doesn't uh, entail always hindering religious groups. It might also help religious groups, but to an equal degree. And then there is a f another way of looking at the whole idea of separation, uh, which I call principal distance. Uh, and here, the idea is that, uh, or rather, the, the, the policy of principal distance is a, is a flexible value-based strategy, which uh, interferes in religions or refuses to interfere in religion, depending upon how it promotes uh, three very crucial values to which I think secularism is committed. Number one, the maintenance of civic peace, that is to say prevention of 
civil war or religious strife to um, the extension of religious liberty to all individuals and groups in society, and three, equality of citizenship. That is to say, uh, in the definition of citizenship, religion is not considered to be relevant. Now, uh, if, I mean, the, in, the, in this idea of principal distance, uh, the state may interfere in, a, in the affairs of a religious group as long as it promotes these three values, or it must refrain from any interference if, uh, uh, if that is the only way in which these values can be sustained. Notice that uh, this idea of principal distance is not the same as equidistance. It is possible for the state to interfere in the affairs of one religious group, but not in the affairs of the religious group, because the only way by which the, the, these three values that I just uh, talked about can be promoted is by interference in that group, right? So uh, uh, a lot of, the, lot of uh, critics of secularism believe that secularism is flawed because it is committed to a policy of equidistance. I don't think that is the case. Uh, what it's committed to is treating all groups and individuals as equals. From that it doesn't follow as the American philosopher Ronald Dawkins once argued, from that it doesn't follow that you have to give them, you have to treat them equally. Treating people equally is not the same as treating them as equals. And secularism is really committed to the idea of treating individuals and groups as equals. A lot of people, a lot of critics of secularism have treated this as, as an anomaly mm -hmm. of the modern nation state which claims to be secular. Because on the classical definition that you yourself pointed out, the equality principle mm -hmm. requires, in a very standard manner, equal treatment. But the fourth definition of your secularism right. yeah. does, has a differential treatment. Yeah. That, that is, in the name of equality, the treatment actually that takes place in practice mm -hmm. is differential. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, mm, on that standard principle, it it sounds as if it is uh, not an equal treatment. That's right. I mean, uh, but equality is a very complicated, very complex idea. Uh, it is not to be equated with sameness. It doesn't mean homogenization. Of course, in some respects, people must be treated equally in some respects. But there are a number of other respects in which to treat them equally would actually be treating them as unequals, right? So it is extremely important that people also be treated differently in order that the value of equality be promoted. I mean, a, a very simple idea. So, supposing we have uh, a, a physically challenged person, right? And he has to go up, he has to go and see a film. Uh, now, it would, be, uh, it would be extremely unfair if uh, a lift or a ramp was not available, right, for that person. Now, uh, people can't object that uh, uh, some special treatment has been given to him. Because by giving that uh, opportunity and access to, uh, to that facility, all that we're doing is enabling him to do things that other people are able to do as a matter of course. Tell me one thing. All those people who are, who are so much after this whole notion of secularism, they think that it, it has failed, mm -hmm. that it is not working properly, mm -hmm. that, it, that it is basically flawed in our own con context, mm -hmm. that it is not a civilizational option that we have opted for. Mm -hmm. What kind of scenario they presuppose? Well, I think most people who have attacked secularism uh, have uh, uh, misunderstood the nature of uh, the doctrine as it exists in India, as it is uh, normatively as it should be practiced in India. They've had a certain conception of secularism as it exi exists in the West. And as a matter of fact, even that version is, uh, uh, I, I, this is being too harsh, but it, even that version is a bit caricatured version of secularism. At any rate, it singles out one particular version uh, in one Western society and takes that as the model of uh, secularism in all societies, all Western societies. Well, I think, uh, as I just uh, pointed out, there are different conceptions of secularism. There are different uh, forms of secularism, in, even in the West. But in important. India, uh, I would say there are five, uh, or four or five features which must be taken note of uh, if we are to grasp, uh, grasp the, the nature of Indian secularism, at, as it were. The first feature is that religion in India is not just a matter of belief. 
Well, this is pretty common knowledge. It's not just a matter of belief, but also a matter of practice. In other words, a person is, uh, the identity of a religious person is defined not by what he or she believes, but what he or she practices. So religious is to be understood in, in the terms of practices rather than purely in terms of belief. That's the first point. The second point is that uh, these, the bearer, I mean, the, these practices belong not to individuals taken singly, but to whole groups. Uh, and I'll come to the relevance of this point in a minute. Uh, the third feature of in, in, in India is that a number of these practices, a number of these social customs are either oppressive or deeply hierarchical in character. And therefore, they, if, from the point of view of, uh, from certain point of views, they need to be changed. Uh, the fourth point is that the relevant agency to bring about these changes or to bring about this internal reform in India is not the church. There because there simply because there is no church here. So uh, either a, a, a religious group has to organize itself formally, or else this role has to be performed willy-nilly by the state. And last of all, uh, the diversity, religious diversity in India is simply mind-boggling. I mean, there is, I mean, this is a point that I don't need to uh, really hammer home. I mean, everybody knows how hugely diverse uh, uh, India is in social and religious terms. Now, what does it mean for secularism? What are all these features? What, 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 are the, what, are, what do they entail for secularism? Well, they entail the following. Number one, let's say the value of, the, let, let me just talk about two values. One is religious liberty. Now, in India, secularism cannot simply mean giving uh, liberty or freedom to individuals to hold certain beliefs. It means giving liberty to groups to, uh, have, to, to have certain practices, right? So uh, f f religious liberty in India cannot be understood only or exclusively uh, along the lines of liberal individualism, but has to be understood also along different lines in group, uh, on, on the lines of, uh, let's use a word that is familiar in political philosophy, let's say along communitarian lines. That's one. Number two, uh, equality of citizenship cannot also be understood Similarly, along liberal individualistic lines, uh, a number of rights that we have as citizens, we have as individuals, and I'm, I'm, I'm firmly committed to that view, and secularism too is committed to that view. But there are some rights that uh, uh, we have qua citizens, but these rights are, we have only because we are members of this or that group. And that also makes the nature of secularism in India quite different. So we have certain cultural rights which are embodied in in the Constitution, uh, which cultural rights uh, f f on, the, on the standard interpretation of secularism would be uh, anathema to it, right? Yes. And finally, uh, as I said, because of the presence of a lot of oppressive and hierarchical practices in India, which need to be changed, where a lot of religions uh, need some internal reform, and as I said, there has to be some kind of state intervention, although I must emphasize here that this intervention cannot be coercive, right? Uh, the state cannot just adopt a policy of non-interference or you know, total abstinence. Mm -hmm. It must also, in some ways, uh, through due deliberative measures, uh, interfere in the affairs of religion in order to change them. I mean, consider, for example, a number of important reforms, say, within Hinduism that were brought about uh, during the course of, you know, in the, in, in the late 40s and the early 50s. I'm thinking of, uh, say, the abolition of the Devadasi dedication. I'm thinking of uh, uh, the ab ab abolition of uh, the, per the permission that is granted, say, to intercaste marriages, or the abolition of child marriage. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I can, the list is just yes. endless. Now, those uh, changes within Hinduism could not have been brought about if uh, we worked along a model of secularism that entailed a strict wall of separation between religion on the one hand and state on the other. If we have actually followed the kind of secularism that you're pointing out, mm -hmm. a very contextually understood uh, formula of secularism mm -hmm. in which we have even redefined it to suit our own situations, uh, what has gone wrong? Why do you think that a lot of people who pay no allegiance, who publicly uh, criticize this principle, mm -hmm. have come to power, have done a lot of things, a lot of damage, Mm -hmm. to secular principles of this country. I mean, you yourself have written that article after the demolition of Babri Masjid, and you mm -hmm. seem to be very 
agitated, mm -hmm. almost inflamed mm -hmm. by you know yeah. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Some explanation must be given to what has happened. You know, to not only just to satisfy the critics in a theoretical terms, but must for our self understanding know what has gone wrong. How come is it? Ha, we've come to a situation where we're publicly challenging, mm. challenging mm. a self-definition that we chose for ourselves as modern Indians. Well, let me try and, I mean, there are a number of explanations for why uh, secularism is in crisis, and I do believe it is in crisis. Uh, many of these have to do with a lot of conceptual confusions, uh, but I shall not try and focus on them, and nor will I try to uh, 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 make a complicit uh, 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 the views of a whole lot of others who have, uh, I mean, well, the v v views uh, which are very, very well known. Uh, let me try and offer some kind of a cultural explanation of this. Uh, uh, you see, consider, for example, our democratization process. Uh, now, I, I think it's a, uh, this is a, one of the great things about India, that we've had a, 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 a consolidation of democracy which means that a number of people who were hitherto debarred from the political arena have now entered that political arena. And that's a terrific thing which has happened. Uh, uh, we have been, you know, uh, with all our problems, we have had a fair degree of political equality. Now, but let's ask ourselves, what does it mean uh, for these people to come into the, polit into the political arena? Now, it's, it, it's not as if they've come in with empty minds. They've come with their own norms, norms which have unsettled the existing norms in society. Now, there has been a proliferation of norms, you know, political norms, uh, which we are witnessing uh, in, in, our, uh, in our polity and our society. Everybody believes that their norm is the, is the best norm. Now, there is no possibility of any dialogue anymore because such, there are so many norms that have proliferated that people believe that, uh, that uh, people say that their norm is the best norm. That's number one. But along with it, there is a radical certainty whether the norms that the people consider to be valid are really valid, right? Now, uh, it's all right for people to keep saying that their norms are the best norms, but, it's all, but, it's, but it so happens that people don't act on those norms anymore. So what has anchored their behavior that anchor point is gone. And when that happens, people start looking for other kinds of anchor points. And here, two anchor points come very easily uh, to give support to people. One is self-interest, material self-interest in particular, and the other is prejudice. And what we're witnessing in our society at a deeper cultural level is the elevation or the valorization of both self-interest on the one hand, individual self-interest, group self-interest, People are just, you know, prepared to do just about anything as long as it advances or maximizes their self-interest, right? Because that's what they're sure of. They're not interested in public norms, public principles. They're interested in just maximizing their own interest. And the second thing, as I said, was prejudice. It's very hard to dislodge prejudices. So the actions of a lot of people are determined purely by these things. Now, secularism, and that's what I, I want to relate it. Secularism is a, prince, is, is a philosophy par excellence of uh, certain kinds of public norms, and it's also a philosophy of restraint. Now, uh, it is bound to be attacked by people who are aggressively uh, espousing only their own cause and who are not willing to enter into other people's shoes or look at a certain issue from the point of view of other people. In your book, mm -hmm. Akhil Belgrami, mm -hmm. in fact, finds one particular uh, reason why perhaps secularism, the classical definition that we arrived at, that we promote, we give equal importance to all religions, and state would interfere in the name of equality to attain this particular result, mm -hmm. e result of equality, will intervene in certain religious matters. And that would be considered proper as far as uh, in conformity with secular understanding of state. Mm -hmm. But Akhil bin Rami points out that maybe what has gone wrong in our self-understanding of secularism is in the way it was conceptualized uh, within the Nehruvian model. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it was a kind of standoff. It was a kind of a Archimedean kind of a procedural kind of a thing, which did not allow a lot of normative issues to come in 
to weigh its own weight, to find its own value. You know, n it was not sort of negotiated mm -hmm. with other communities. And perhaps one, I mean, a lot of critics in your book have pointed out, Tian Madan, Ashish Nandi, uh, Partha Chatterjee, they all have this very cynical mm -hmm. understanding towards this particular definition of, of secularism, S a definition which did not take account of the reality of, of Indian uh, groupism, uh, religious uh, factors, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Bill Garami even points out very, in a very specific manner, particularly points out at Nehru, that he did not allow, in the interest of his own uh, definition of secularism, he did not allow a negotiated mm -hmm. arrival of a new definition, mm -hmm. which could have been perhaps more lasting, much better, you know. And uh, uh, he doesn't think that it's because of modernity and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to blame modernity for the failure of secularism. That's right. He thinks yeah. there's a particular, there's even a much more specific reason for the failure. Mm. Do you think, do you agree with him? Well, I mean, part, partly, uh, yes, I partly agree with what he's saying. Uh, you see, there, there has been a problem uh, in India, which is the nature of communities. Uh, communities in India have been oppressive and hierarchical, right? Consider, for example, our caste system. It is internally, in some ways, it is internally oppressive. I mean, there may be some good features in it. I'm not going to uh, uh, but uh, as a deny that. But I as a yes. structure, it's very uh, inegalitarian, it's hierarchical. And uh, it is internally oppressive, particularly to women. Now, uh, so communities are hierarchical. Uh, and these hierarchical communities can be very warm. I mean, people who are in a relation of subordination can also, in some senses, have a lot of love for each other. Uh, so, so, so we've had warm hierarchical communities. Uh, uh, now, uh, people, th at some people thought that the only way to disband these hierarchical communities is by turning to a certain kind of individualism. So, any form of communitarianism they confused they uh, confuse with communalism, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to make a distinction between communi communitarianism on the one hand. Maybe this is something which one can judge, which can, which uh, one can uh, uh, talk about only retrospectively. I, I really uh, am not uh, a good enough historian to judge whether such a distinction uh, was possible uh, in the 1940s and uh, in the 30s. But it's certainly now, in, in, uh, by hindsight, we can say that there is a very important distinction here between communitarianism on the one hand and communalism on the other. Communalism, I would. Uh, uh, describe as the view that uh, wants to maximize the interests of one's own community necessarily at the expense of other communities, right? Communitarianism, on the other hand, is the view which only uh, 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 emphasizes that an individual in part or the identity of, uh, of an individual is in part defined by the community. Now, uh, maybe uh, such, a, such a distinction was not made properly by, by people who were looking for, uh, for uh, people who were forming the secular state. Had they done so, they would definitely have searched out uh, the more egalitarian people from different communities. And as members of those communities, that if they would have involved them in the whole political process, right? And they could have reached a negotiated settlement. But uh, so, it, I, I mean, in principle, it's, a, it's an attractive idea, uh, you know, the kind of idea that Bill Grammy has put forward. I'm not sure whether historically uh, it, was, it was viable at that time. That is for a historian to judge. The other thing, of course, is that, uh, the, you know, the events of uh, partition certainly made a mess of everything. everything yes, and uh, that meant that no negotiated settlement was, was really possible. I mean, that, that was the end of all negotiated settlements. But, so. uh, I'm very sure that one lesson, one big lesson that we have to learn from the situation of crisis is to rearticulate it, reinterpret it. And as you said in your book, and I quite agree with the motto of the book, that our option is not to uh, choose an alternative to secularism, but an alternative understanding of secularism. 
That is to say, the state will have to take the responsibility of promoting the interest of each and all without, uh, without uh, making a real discriminations. The majority, major, majoritarian principle in the society has to be very, very sensitive to the minorities. Unless we actually follow this kind of understanding, we are, I'm very sure we are going to lose not only secularism, but quite a lot. Perhaps Absolutely. in the society itself will be, uh, will find itself in a barbaric situation and we'll be quite ashamed of ourselves. We might even lose the state, we might even lose the civilizational structure that we have. Mm -hmm. One is not very sure of what we're going to choose if we, we are going to reject secularism. I'm very glad to have had this, this discussion with Professor Rajiv Bhargo, and uh, I thank him for coming here. And I hope that his book, Secularism and Its Critics, uh, uh, will be useful to many more people who who are troubled by whatever is happening in our country today in terms of secularism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.